welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm going to try and get someplace. Well, there's no place for me to stand that the post isn't in the way. So for those people, now everybody can see a part of me. All right. Um, welcome. My name is Paul Gamble. I uh, work most of the time with the Community Engagement Lab. And I'm uh, night lighting uh, with this wonderful project, which is called uh, Montpelier Arts Synergy Project, which I hope you've all heard of. Uh, it's been percolating along uh, with uh, a major goal of creating a master plan for public art for Montpelier. <clears throat> and we've been lucky enough to work with an exciting team out of Columbus, Ohio. And Amanda Golden is here, our lead consultant, who is a specialist in creating public policy that advances public art. And the long term, or the, the end goal of this project is to be submitting a set of policies uh, that the city council uh, will consider and adopt as formal policy on how the city wants to advance and fund going forward uh, different funding mechanisms for public art in Montpelier. And so that's been an exciting process of community workshops that we've been having over the last several months. And nothing like a competition to get the crowd to turn out. Uh, this is the biggest crowd we've had so far for an Arts Energy event. Uh, and we're, we're running out of chairs, at, at, which is a wonderful problem to have. We'll take some of these up here. So there are chairs up here we can steal you guys come, who are coming in. We can squeeze you in or they're getting some out back there. Thanks. We'll we'll figure it out um, there's another seat up front here two more up here people want to you want these chairs as well yeah uh, let's leave one for oh, well i don't think it would sit there oh yeah, you're yeah. going to move uh, that one's yeah i got I'm all seats that one okay. uh, let's see we got we got one over here on the side <coughs> Just pausing for a second while we get everybody seated. Oh, they're, they're, they're pulling out the bleacher seats. I love it. Okay. Are there enough seats back there now? Okay, thank you. Okay, so just one last word about our Synergy Project, and then I'm going to introduce Nathan Suter, who's the chair of the Artist uh, Selection Committee. Um, but this project has been funded by a $50,000 grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, which the city received a couple years ago. And it was tied into the energy that the city has uh, been generating around a lot of uh, public planning efforts, uh, including the new One Taylor Street project, uh, which, of course, is the new transit center and uh, apartments that's going in at uh, one Taylor Street site. And it was out of that uh, energy that the city council also allocated uh, with the leadership of uh, Mayor Holler t to uh, assign $50,000 from that project budget, much to the dismay of the architects, uh, but we carved out $50,000 for uh, a work of art. Uh, so uh, this is really the result of that uh, vision that the council had to use the Taylor Street project as really a catalyst for a discussion around how public art lives in Montpelier. And that's what inspired the National Endowment for the Arts to come in with us uh, with a $50,000 match to that. And then we're also raising about 50000 to finish off the planning and cultural design portion of the project. So this is really meant to be uh, this piece that we'll be selecting out of these finalists will be the celebration of that process, that planning process, and serve to really highlight the power of public art, uh, significant public art that can be installed it in a permanent basis and really bring vibrancy and a new way for Montpelier to come together and, and look at itself through art. So with that, um, I'm going to hand it off. There has been a, a committee formed to help uh, shepherd through this process of selecting an artist, and Nathan Souter has been the chair of that committee. So, Nathan? Uh, good evening, welcome. My name is Nathan Souter. I was the chair of the Artist Selection Committee, and uh, I'm going to keep this really quick because the stars of the show are champions bit to present. 
Um, this has been a really great process. I'd like to ask Bob, Greg, Jill, and John to stand for just a moment, please. So these four, together with me, were the Artist Selection Committee. Uh, we had really terrific process of pre-meeting to talk about process, and then two solid meetings where we went through the applicant pool um, and tried to select a range of artists who we thought had the caliber and the quality and the vision to pull something off. And from at least my perspective, this is high stakes. This is a $50,000 arts commission uh, used using the public money in the public space. It's going to live for a long time. Uh, you know, I want 30 years from now. I want my children to look back on this as a as a seminal moment. And uh, so, you know, no pressure, folks. <laughs> um, but thanks to the thanks to this committee. It's been a, it's been a great committee. Uh, kudos to Paul and Amanda and others and John Holler who have pushed this forward and said yes to fifty thousand dollars and done the work to get the NEA involved. Uh, this is how this is how a community gains another facet of its identity or augments a facet of its identity. And so, this is our community. Uh, we all have a say in this, and we all have a say in what's uh, what's in the future. So let's keep whatever energy we have here in the room tonight and push it forward. So thanks for coming. So our process tonight is that each of the finalists, either individual artists or artist teams, will have 30 minutes to present. They're required within that 30 minutes. They can use that any way they want. Uh, I believe all of them have brought a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and they're required to uh, reserve at least 10 minutes of that for questions. Uh, that'll first go to the committee and then uh, to the audience. And they may use more than 10 minutes of that time if they want for questions, but that's up to them. And so we've had a random drawing uh, just to heighten the anticipation <laughs> to the last second uh, we had a random drawing of what order we're going to go in. And so we're going to start with um, Miles Chapin. And let's get at it. I'm going to dim right. the lights and we'll. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay. So, hi, I'm Miles Chapin. I'm a granite sculptor living in Montpelier. <laughs> Sorry, we're in Montpelier. I'm living in Westminster West. Vermont with my wife and two kids. Um, this is the project, uh, but before I really dig into this project, I want to kind of give you context to my work. Um, so here we go. This is my studio that I recently built. Um, it's allowed me to work on larger and larger scale pieces um, right here from my studio. This is Haven, um, a recent public artwork that I've created um, for a visitor and transportation center. Um, this piece is three strands woven together with openings um, in between. And it was really meant to represent the community all moving together and the connections there. This is the public art piece I'm currently working on. Um, this site was, is near a river and walking path, um, and I wanted to look at a river for this project as a community and look at the connections um, within that. So again, it's three strands with, uh, weaving together with openings um, to look through and for kids to climb on next to the walking path. And it's, um, there's a mill wheel that I'll hand point um, to kind of as there's milling, um, many mill buildings in that area to relate to the history. For this project, I interpreted the design challenge for one Taylor Street as a way to bring people together, to create a centerpiece for this building, and to create a gateway to the city. So I've identified the um, front rain garden of this property as a site that will best achieve these goals um, and get the most bang for your buck, if you will. So here's the design set into the space. Um, I wanted two elements flowing together to create the um, message of coming together and to represent, represent the Winooski and the North Branch coming together. Um, the taller piece will be berry gray. The um, shorter piece will be Bethel white. 
and the base stone will be from Woodbury, Vermont. Um, this is also under um, the scupper, so the rainwater from the roof will be able to come um, and flow between the two elements. Here's the design giving a little more context to the front of the building and showing how it's under the um, ring, uh, under the roof for the ring. Here's the dimensions. It's 10, um, the Barry Gray block will be 10 and a half feet tall and the Bethel White block will be nine feet tall um, with an overall height of 12 to 12 and a half feet depending on the thickness of the base, which will depend on the installation. I wanted to leave the outside of the blocks as they are, um, as quarry blocks, to really give that um, beginning of the story and to give that sense of history of this area of quarrying. I'll then um, split large pieces off of the sides to give inherent movement in the rough stone. And then the center pieces will be polished um, and carved, kind of separating and coming together. Here's a map showing the three locations of the quarries um, and how their proximity to Montpelier. Um, I really wanted to use these materials as an exposition of Vermont's granite um, and for this project to really stand as that history, um, to represent that history of quarrying um, and really give a sense of place. Um, I want to show the top to give you a little more sense of how the water will flow over the design. This scooped out section is where the water will flow um, and will act as a pitcher to flow in between the two. So it will flow onto the second piece and given surface tension will also flow down. This is a side view um, and this is the view you'd see coming from the south um, over the bridge. And that flat surface will be the quarry block um, that I'll leave as a quarry block. Um, and then you see this, the large um, scoops will be split from the side. And this is to give you more of a sense of the two colors. The splitting technique I use it, um, requires no drilling, so there'll be minimal tool marks. So you really get the movement of the material um, and you aren't um, stuck to a drill hole. Um, so it really can just be the split sur um, surface along that edge. A large part of this design is the negative area. Um, both the negative space between the two separate blocks, but also the negative space within each block. I want to polish the scooped out sections um, so the edge of each block that kind of creates its own space so it reflects the light, and this is also where the water will flow. But the outer part of the carved section, I want to have, um, have much more texture with bushing hammer, so it really holds onto the light and have a kind of a softness to it. Again, it'll feel like the carved pieces are departing from the split blocks and moving together. This is a piece I um, recently created, and I wanted to put it in to kind of give you a sense of that, those textures. Um, as you can see in the inside, it's bushing hammered, um, which really holds the light, like I was saying, and I polished the, the lip of this piece. Um, you also notice in the bottom left um, of the sculpture, the tool marks that are left from splitting, so really not much. Here's a sculpture, um, as you'll see it from in, within the lobby. Um, I really wanted to create an asymmetrical design 
so as you walk around the design, it has a very different composition. Um, As water um, and through the seasons, water will freeze and snow will build up and really integrate into the landscape. I really want to go embrace this fact. Um, and here's an example of what my pieces blending in with the snow sweeping through the pieces. I want to talk about community involvement. Um, I'm really excited to involve the community in this process um, and would like to start that process with um, sitting down with the community and talking over the design and this project um, and then um, involve the community um, working in Barry. So, and I got this idea from working with symposiums, uh, sculpture symposiums where a few artists or um, several artists are selected and come together um, to work in public. Um, this is a really nice process as it gets to involve the community from the beginning so that once the sculpture is installed, there's a real sense of ownership. Um, so what I'm proposing is um, instead of bringing the block directly to my studio, keeping it in Barrie and doing the initial rough out process over a few day, maybe a week span um, to split and um, do those initial cuts so that the community can really be involved. Um, this would be give opportunity for um, school trips to come or um, people to really get involved and ask questions. Um, and I can demonstrate especially the uh, splitting technique, which gives for a good show. So here's um, multiple views of the piece. Um, Thing, but um, I wanted to give a view of the of it spinning here, but I guess it's not going to work. Um, I'd like to open up um, discussion really with the with the group from this point and um, kind of dig into this project further. I don't know if we can turn on the lights. For our process, we'll have the, any of the committee members who want to ask questions first, and then when we get a sense that uh, they're set for a while, we'll open up to the audience for questions. So any committee members want to invite questions or ask questions? I'm, I'm intrigued by your, uh, your proposal to involve the community yeah. in your process. So you'd keep the block in Barry for a while, and you'd invite people to come and watch you do it? Yeah, so I've spoken with a granite shop that would be um, willing to let me work outside. Um, and then I have a few other ideas for locations. So the community, um, so I can work on that piece, um, and the community can come and see and participate um, how they'd like. But really as a kind of a demonstration, of this process, so yeah, I think it would be a really nice way to get involved. Yeah, anybody yeah, is welcome please. to answer, ask questions. So, anybody else want any thoughts for Miles? Yes, sir. Yeah, I don't know if I should ask this, but um, what's the ability of, of that rock to recover from vandalism? Yeah, so I um, usually use a sealer, um, especially with the water. Um, so spray paint and something like that can be um, how pressure washed off and isn't really an issue. Okay. 
Where did you get the idea? I um, was playing with multiple ideas um, and wanted to incorporate the water element, um, and then really, really realized that I wanted the stone to feel like it was flowing together, and the water to be just a separate element. Um, so I played. That was really where the idea came from: was the confluence of the Winooski and the North Branch, and really representing that as the two rivers coming together. Yes. So I'm not really familiar with the design of the building. Um, the uh, the water is only going to be coming down onto the uh, sculpture during rainstorms, or is there yeah, a way right. Is there, yeah, right. <clears throat> For rainwater. And then is there a holding pool or reflecting? Like yeah. So there? yeah, I'm glad I asked you, uh, you asked that. I'm not sure I explained that properly. So um, the base will be scooped out. Um, so as the water comes down the sculpture, it'll be collected into the base stone where it can flow off to the sides um, for the rain garden. Yes? Do you anticipate any lighting? Yeah, I would love to underlight the sculpture. I think that would make it, um, as you saw in some of these, dramatically lit. Um, I think that would, that would create a really dramatic um, and nice composition. So I definitely would hope to, uh, to do that. Yeah? Uh, can you tell us more about the splitting process that you were talking about? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a um, actually a Japanese technique of car splitting. So I guess to give you to start from the beginning, the, the typical way to split is you drill a series of holes and use feathers and wedges into those holes. So instead of drilling the holes, you carve pockets into the stone. Um, this enables you to split on a kind of three-dimensional. Um, as you don't have holes to set your path. So you can set it at an angle and scoop, or you can set it on a curve and scoop that way. Um, and this way, you have really very little um, tool marks. That's a really nice way to very control your split. Yes? I'm not sure exactly the location, but can you actually walk all the way around it? And is it meant yes. to interface with Absolutely. it? Can I go touch it? And Absolutely, yeah. So um, there's a ramp behind it, as well as um, the walkway is right next to it. Um, and it's five feet wide in a six foot um, rain garden. So it'll be very much so touchable and interactable. Um, I'd also like to propose Splitting the split pieces that I extract from this sculpture could be, um, with additional funding, used as benches for the for the interior of the space, which I thought would be a really nice way, depending on uh, how the puns work. Yes. Can you give a sense of what you see when you look through the negative space? Yeah. And I know it seemed like you would see the building from one angle. Yep. And what are some of the other angles? Like, what are you going to be seeing through? Yeah. So as you look. From the lobby, which there's quite a bit of glass there, you'll be able to look through the sculpture. Um, yeah, and then from the other way, you'll be able to look um, through. But there's also negative space. As you're coming from the south, you get some negative space. I don't know if I can um, show that. But you get some negative space coming from that other, um, from the south, with the vertical piece in front. Um, there's negative space from that way as well. So, but there'll be buildings in the background. Yes? Uh, what's the risk of uh, uh, cracking as it goes through freeze thaw cycles? Um, I will make, the risk would be if there was a fracture already, but um, since we have such beautiful quarries here, it should be no problem to get a nice clean block. Yes? Could you go back to one of the earlier images that has the building in it and yeah. describe a little bit more about the how the rain garden is designed into the building already and how sure. the piece integrates into that? Absolutely. Seth, you want to get the light? Just that front one, Seth, thanks. Yeah. Let's Let's go go there we go. Yeah. No. Give us the Okay, so this is the um, this roof line here is where the water will collect. And there'll be a scupper um, depositing the water on top of this top piece which will collect and act as a pitcher to really um, spout the water to the next piece, where it will flow down that inner curve section to where the base collects 
Um, and then given surface tension, and I've actually played with the model a little bit, it pours down the face that you cannot see on the, uh, the taller piece. Um, so it flows down both sides as it comes down. Um, and the way I understand it, you really want to break the water's flow to be able to collect it. So um, this piece will do that, um, break the water's movement, collect it in um, the base, and then let it spill off the sides. Can you explain what this view is, like where we're standing right now when we look at this? Yeah, sure. So um, this is Taylor Street um, just coming into the city. Um, looking at the kind of front of the building. Um, to the south is the bridge, and to the north, as I understand it, is the coming into the city. Uh, and so buses will pull up right um, in front of here and get off, and you'll be able to see it kind of as you come in and as you're leaving. Can I just please? Hey, Greg Gosselin, just give me a... So I'm Taylor Street. The bridge is here. Yes. State Street is over here. Capitol Plaza is right this side. The railroad tracks <clears throat> on to our left of this building. The river is to the right. So buses will come. Buses. Some buses will come in along the left side of the building, come underneath, and come out the right side. Some will simply pull up right up here. That helps people. Is that right, Craig? The main entry to the transit center are those dark colored doors to the right. Yeah, in the main entrance. Yes, exactly. Sorry. With that, no, thank you. I could, really appreciate it. Could you that. go back to the bigger image of the whole building you had earlier? Yeah. Uh, Here. Yeah. So, okay. So that circle is where the sculpture will be placed, and this uh, view is kind of coming. I mean, you can see the Taylor Street from here, um, and the buses, the tur bus turnaround is. Um, coming under, coming around the building. This, this view is from the river, right? What was that? I think this view is from the river. Oh, maybe yeah. This is from the river. That's to your left. This is from the river. This is looking yes. north. This is looking yeah, north. north. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the his sculpture, or the circle, is at the main entrance, which is Taylor Street, is going alongside that left side of the image. Yes. Thank you. So he says like you're at the, you're at. Uh, the shell station, looking across the river. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Ideas? Thoughts? Feelings? Yes? You mentioned the ramp here. Would that mean that people would use wheelchairs or otherwise have mobility limitations? Yeah. Behind. So behind the sculpture here is a ramp to access the building. Um, and you can see the clock there. Yeah. And how far away is the bike path? Oh, the bike path? Yeah. It's a quarter of a block away. The bike path is right alongside the river. So it's on the other side of the building? Yeah. Yeah, that, that large view that was showing just before this, that was about standing at the bike path looking back at the building. Any other questions or thoughts? Thank you, Miles. Thank you all for, for coming. Um, I'd, I'd like to give some special thanks to folks in the audience, but first let me introduce our team. Uh, Michael Singer and I are the team leaders. Michael is in the box. Say, <laughs> say hello to Michael. Hi, Michael. Hello, everyone. Michael. Uh, <laughs> Sarah I'm here. Hoffmeyer. I'm in the box. <laughs> Sarah, Sarah Hoffmeyer here uh, is our horticulturist, Meg Ostrom and Erica Heilman are our sound engineers and audio experts here. And Steve Libby is representing the River Conservancy, our river keepers. So um, I'd also like to
thank Paul for doing such a good job of tracking us down and keeping us in order. And um, a big thanks to Tim Turway for helping us visualize our ideas. Thank you, Tim. So on with our proposal. We have a young man here that we watched come out of the bank building at our first site visit. And uh, he negotiated several uh, large parking lots, the railroad, a couple of, couple of uh, snow fences to get down to this barren space on Taylor Street where he could sit on the guardrail overlooking the Winooski and eat his lunch while listening to the river and warming in the sun. This young man became our poster boy. And he became the person who represents all those longing to face the river. We call this place the confluence because it's where the North Branch and the Winooski Rivers meet. But it's also a confluence where there is a flow of people. Over the centuries, we've uh, met to use the river for commerce, for recreation, for transportation. With this project, we hope to make the confluence a place where travelers along the path or through the transit center flow the flow of visitors from the capital, seniors, dog walkers on their daily outings, joggers, inline skaters, families on bikes come together to understand the nature of the river the ways that we can benefit from its meanderings, and ways that we can help protect it. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Good. You. If you can't, let me know. Um, at the moment, this place is a blank canvas, and we have an opportunity yet to be realized. Still, it's unadorned, undeveloped place has a lot going for it. It's got sun coming in on the south. It has more river frontage than any other property uh, in, uh, per acre in, in the town. In the downtown, we have a situation where there's more parking lots backing up to these uh, riverfront properties than we would care to see. Um, but now, the time has come for this former parking lot, this former brownfield, granite landing, to be born again. So we have um, a diverse and curious team. Um, and we studied the site and uh, noted that the architecture is solid, and the site is solid, and the river is meandering down to the lake. And we've asked, how can we create an experience up above the floodplain of the river, which lies below? How can we bring that river up to the site? How can we bring some fluidity to the rigidity of the architecture and the site? Michael? Yes. We're hoping you might have some reflection on that. Um, okay. Can you, have, are you, you, um, have you? Are you showing a slide from the gas station? We are. And we're showing okay. how the river might be meandering on down through there. Are you meandering along with it? Yes, I am. <laughs> and, and I'd like to just start, Elizabeth, by first of all telling everyone what an honor and a delight it's been to engage with this outstanding team. I know many of you in Montpelier, you know, these are folks who you've known for years, many of you, and um, you're very fortunate to have them working on this, and I feel very fortunate to be connected to them. I moved to Vermont in 1971, and I want to just also say it's wonderful for me to be considered uh, for this project. 
uh, to be working with my colleagues on this, and um, and we sure hope we can um, we can move it forward. Um, I've known Elizabeth for many years. I've known Meg for many years. Um, so uh, we we date back to projects uh, back into the 1980s, and uh, and with Meg and and with Elizabeth uh, from the 90s on. So uh, I just wanted to say um, this is very special for me. It's very special, I would also say, for the city to have a team like this coming together. Um, and as the team, we're approaching this public art request by thinking systematically about the site and the site's opportunities to make connections that lead to socially responsive, sustainable, and aesthetic solutions. Our process as a team began questioning, um, a questions that reframe the challenges most would assume to be related to public art. You know, what is what, what are we doing as a team coming forward for a public art project? And we explored the questions. Um, we have lots. Of, we have good answers. I would also say. Um, and we explored these questions as an interdisciplinary team, which is most exciting, bringing about a wonderful collaboration that's opened up possible solutions. And we hope you'll agree that these are beneficial solutions as well for what public art can mean for Montpelier and also what this project can bring to the community. Um, so can you go on to the next slide, Elizabeth? Yes. We're, okay, we're, so it's a photo turning to the east of the dam and Main Street Bridge. Um, our collaborative challenge was to conceive of opportunities and solutions that are unique to this particular place and this particular community. And we see our public art approach and, and what it addresses leading to precedence for other sites along the river. So we're, we're not just seeing this I mean, of course, this, we, we want this to happen here, but we also see that um, it can happen beyond this and be a model for other communities as well. Um, the next slide is uh, the confluence from Taylor Street Bridge. Um, our hope is for this proposal to become the catalyst, not only for how Montpelier addresses its riverfronts, but also for how the city sees the role public art can have. And um, I, I, uh, I hope this, uh, the results here um, will also uh, create future opportunities that the city, the, the Public Arts Committee sees that expand on this concept for, for other projects as you move forward. Um, so uh, the next slide is a project of mine that's, um, this is the Ecotarium in Worcester, Mass. I was part of the design team as the artist on the team. Um, and uh, I, this slide um, will give you an idea of how uh, some of the items, the ideas, the, the structure that, that we're considering for this site as well. And some may ask, um, where, so where's the, where's the piece of art? Um, well, among several goals, this public art project um, that we're talking about from Montpelier will advance the community's interactions and understanding. Our team considers a primary outcome of this public art project resulting in the positive reinvigoration of a stormwater system. Yes, it, it's art with a functional program. And we see this project setting a precedent for public art policies in the city. Um, it's a powerful example that can expand artists and the general public's understanding of interactions, benefits, and opportunities for public art, not only for our project with you, but for future ones. And I hope you'll agree. Um, can we go to the next slide, the Seminoles? Uh, this is a slide of um, a project that is for the Seminole tribe. Uh, it's a project down in South Florida. In this particular project, um, public art is actually treating 150 gallons of stormwater 
that's coming from retention ponds in the area. Um, there's a relationship here to what we're proposing as well. What we propose is a demonstration of public art's ability to engage in multifunctional problem solving. Wow, art that solves problems. Um, and it can demonstrate crucial environmental regeneration and it can also meet infrastructure needs as well as provide community awareness and understanding. And of course our work will um, also provide a beautiful, inspiring aesthetic experience. I hope you'll agree with us that it's doing this. So it's excellent, the landscape architects and the architects for the project, for this, this site, have designed a series of rain gardens that will gather pollutants before they get to the rivers. Um, we're building on that, that's, that's really excellent. And we embrace these elements in our design and we're grateful that they're part of the underlying structure of the one Taylor Street Transit Center project. Um, so the next slide is a close-up of the, one of the benches at the Seminole um, uh, project, the water wall. So there's the water wall and then there's a seating area. There's also an educational panel so people can understand <laughs> that the, the aesthetics, the art of this is also a, um, what it's actually doing and, and, and what it's addressing uh, in terms of the infrastructure of the site. So you're seeing a close-up of, of the bench. Um, this is a, a seating uh, possibility uh, that we would like to see in the site as well. Um, I'll let you go forward, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And now let's hear it from the river <laughs> So. As you seek a new connection to the Winooski River that flows just a stone's throw away, we can consider enhancing water quality by treating stormwater runoff from the parking areas and the rooftops of the new transit center in a new and innovative way. Next. A first step along that path is the vertical column that connects the rain garden to the roof of the transit center. During a rainstorm, this column will come to life with a gentle cascade of water from the roof and direct that water through the roots and soils of the rain garden, cleansing and purifying before it flows into the Winooski River. This small example of stormwater cleansing can be both an aesthetic experience, but also an educational opportunity to show visitors of the transit center the potential of urban spaces to be strong ecological partners with their rivers. Great, great. Now I'm going to run through some rapid-fire uh, slides here just to say that we began at the front door of the Transit Center and you saw with uh, Chapin, uh, Miles Chapin's uh, site, we, we picked the same site to, to work with and Chapin, I don't know if you're still here, yeah. we've created a home for you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, we begin at the front door and you see the column there that we envision uh, as water um, falling uh, through, a, through a, a sort of a canister, if you will, of mesh. Uh, and the plan further towards us um, shows a very generous 40 foot long rectangular rain garden with a relatively narrow corridor on either side. There is a drawing of it. And we were intrigued uh, with this idea of angularity and geometry in the architecture and the potential for something less rigid when we invited the presence of uh, the metaphorical river in the form of the, the, the meander. And you can see when the meander is introduced to the architecture, we get a couple of little spaces in there where we can put seating and have people gather. And then that looks more like that. <laughs> and uh, we envision the 
the meander starting at the front door, traveling um, over to the outlook over the river, and back again. So our project is shown in the meander from the front door to the turnabout at the bike racks, if you will. And the, the purple and red extension on down the bike path is in our dreams, maybe someday, maybe, maybe some other plan to uh, introduce the meander to the, to the bike path. So we return to the front door, and there is a garden uh, that we want to explore, and we'll ask our horticulturists to take us in a walk uh, down the 40-foot length of a now curvilinear rain garden at the front door of the, the center. Plants, my favorite. So, the two beds that we created, which you'll see in just a moment, have a diverse amount of native Vermont plants. Um, these ones that you see here are part of the wetland garden, which has the column of water that comes down. There's also the rain garden that's a little bit further to the north, which you'll see in just a second in the plan view. Um, and all of these species that were chosen have tons of color. Um, it's year-round interest. So there are berries. They, um, like I said, they're all natives. And so one of the big benefits of natives is that they're meant to be here. They're indigenous to Vermont. So they're found in our forests, along our rivers, in our meadows, and they're best able to support the wildlife as well. So looking at, this is looking down onto the garden, so the very bottom of it is the entrance to the transit center. Um, another great benefit of natives is that visitors um, that are coming from all over Vermont um, can take this combination of plants and replicate them in their own gardens if they have the same site conditions. Something else that's so important to us is being able to slow the sto storm water and to filter out contaminants, which these plants also do. And finally, um, oh, the other thing was, we've created these gardens as a quiet respite from uh, the busy transit center, but there's a lot of activity going on with the pollinators, the amphibians, the different animals and creatures. We're hoping that the visitors that are sitting on these benches are getting um, a small taste of river wildlife up close. Could be a hummingbird that's coming by, or maybe a monarch butterfly, and they're able to pick up one of those QR codes that's on the bench, and Meg's gonna talk further about what those QR codes can do. Okay, <laughs> so simple signage would cue you to a set of audio postcards accessible via QR codes embedded within the, bun within the bench. Think of these audio postcards as mini documentaries, combining stories and interview clips featuring, featuring commentaries by experts and everyday people, a mix of voices with ambient sounds or music. So you might choose to listen to a segment about what this place looked like 500 years ago or 200 years ago um, and 100 years ago, or to a segment about how plants and vegetation clean the river or to a sound tapestry featuring high school volunteers talking about their experience participating in the annual Friends of the Winooski September Clean Up the River event. Because these, are, these audio postcards are accessed via the web, you might decide to listen on the spot or to wait until after you've left the site, perhaps while you're riding the bus to your destination. We envision starting with a collection of five to seven imaginatively produced pieces two to five minutes long, that will entertain, educate, and engage listeners. The content of these segments would be developed with input from community focus groups, and the collection would live on a web page on the Vermont River Conservancy website. Okay, and in conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would just would like to add that this is a living design designed to 
help people understand how art is infrastructure and infrastructure is art. So we have 10 minutes for questions. Does the committee want to start or shall we open it right up? Committee members, you turn on. John? Yeah, I have a question. So this is intended to be a permanent structure, of course. So how would you envision the, uh, and particularly, uh, so the maintenance of the, of the, of the horticultural ones there over the, the, over the decades? The plants. You know, the plants. We're, we're, we'll have our horticulturists <laughs> answer that question. I think we're looking to, is this, uh, this is a great opportunity to use um, the Master Gardener program. I know they need volunteer hours every, every year, master composters, but then also as an educational opportunity for um, students, that um, it's a living, breathing stormwater infrastructure, and um, we're hoping that we can get some other community members to help us with maintenance. But um, but also, I, I mean, we've thought about, well, I don't want to go into too many details. Yes, thank you. Um, the audio portions, the audio mini documentaries or sound tapestries that one can listen to there or anywhere, will there be an opportunity if one does not have a smartphone to access those in a moment? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. That's one he asked if, if, the QR, if the info on the QR codes could be accessed without a smartphone. The, the audio The portion. audio portion. Um, since these documents would have a life in the uh, website of uh, the River Conservancy, um, yes, if you have access to a computer, you would have access to this information. And the signage could indicate that if you go to the website, you can hear it. Um, the, your idea about the the bustle of the transit center and then the bustle of the wildlife, including pollinators and amphibians, um, which I, I love that vision. I'm struck by the sort of, um, that this is an island surrounded by concrete. <laughs> and so <laughs> pollinators, sure, and hummingbirds, possibly, and maybe a few amphibians. So I'm just wondering how, how you see that interaction. For example, I don't want to entice things to try to transit between this garden and the river and become mushed. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear the question? Yes. He asked how the, uh, the connection between the living elements of the piece uh, might be maintained, and they didn't want to inspire the living elements to be uh, run over. Right. Trans transitioning between that installation and the river, and how, how, how might that work? I think how we're envisioning this portion of it is it's a small sampling. It's such a micro ecosystem. Um, and I don't think the goal is to get as much wildlife as possible, but to show the possibilities here. And then hopefully around the corner where the true unfragmented um, riparian buffer is, that's where like the zoo of wildlife is. So um, um, there's fragmentation everywhere in, in a city. And I think if you can if you can show people even just a small bit of the river wildlife, um, I don't think it's going to be a mass migration of turtles or anything like that. I think we'll get <laughs> a really small sampling, and they're going to be hanging out where they're most happy, which is by the river. Yeah. Uh, in the back, Nancy. Um, what happens when it's very cold and the water coming off the roof is ice? Do we have an ice sculpture? Well, uh, you saw one of the pictures, uh, the Ecotarium in, uh, in Worcester that Michael uh, worked on. Michael, are you still with us? Yeah, I am. I didn't, qu I didn't hear the question, though, but, the question, um, but go for it. I'll follow it. The question has to do with the ice formation potential uh, at the, how did you deal with it at the Ecotarium? Okay, well, what we did um, with the, I mean, what, in this particular case, the water is really about storm water, and it's being uh, run off the roof when there is a, a rain event. So that's, uh, you know, a seasonal piece. But it could certainly also, and what we did at the Ecotarium, um, we created a mist system, a drip system, 
which basically collected um, ice, so it created an ice wall. And if you go back to that photo, you can see that wall in the distance. Um, so it just forms wonderful icicles. That's a possibility. That's something we would want to explore with, um, you know, with the architect and uh, and understand how that might be able to actually become part of this. But it is a possibility. John. Yeah, Elizabeth, I wasn't sure of your your flowing connection between the garden and the the, the walking path. Yes. Um, yeah. There is. You'll notice the blue line yeah. on the. Um, that blue line is the is the symbol of the meandering river. So it would that actually be brought, in the pavement. Or, yes, it would yeah. be an inlay in the pavement. Right of a different um, material. Yeah. And you saw um, an indication of that in one of Michael's pieces, the, the, uh, the paving uh, beneath the bench right. uh, was in two, two different colors. And the invitation that we would make is for the person arriving at the front door at the, at the garden to follow the yellow brick road, as it were, uh, down to the river, down to the bike path, and it is our hope that someday that meander could take you right down the entire length of the of the site along the bike path, either causing the bike path to meander or being an overlay in the, the bike path. Thank you. In the back. So um, the first couple of slides were looked like there were these benches, kind of wild looking benches, and I thought that was the project, but I need some clarification. I, I don't know if I ever saw the bench, or are people going to be sitting somewhere on this wall, or what? If you could just clarify kind of what, where people are going to be hanging out. Yeah, they'll, they'll be hanging out here. There's a bench right there. There's a bench right there. Um, and you'll notice the little orange squares along the bench. No? Yeah. Uh, how about the close up at the end? Um, there, see those little orange dots? So they're, they're the QR code located on the bench. Um, or within the bench. Or within the bench. Um, that uh, are very much like the Michael Singer Seminal bench, which we could pull up also. Um, Is the bench made of granite or something, or what? Uh, materials are up for discussion. Um, we hope to involve people in that discussion. Um, Michael can speak to it. Um, uh, it could be a locally fabricated um, concrete. It could be uh, granite. Um, the Ecoterium, I think, was granite. The Seminole is concrete. Right. And, and if we, uh, we you know, I've, I've got experience working with granite importers in Barry for many, many years. There's an opportunity to them to do the fabrication if we work on the bench. Um, there's also, Elizabeth has been doing some research for uh, casting facilities for concrete in the area as well. And we, the studio, would provide all the molds and the patterning and the rubber for which those pieces could be cast from. Jill? Just, just the materials also for the, um, the mesh. The, the curved mesh, what did, what did you envision? Is that going to be metal? Is that going to be? The rain. The scuffle. rain. The, yeah. Um, is Michael, that part of the installation? Yes. M Michael? The I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. The question is materials for the uh, mesh around the, the, the rain. The rain cur curtain. Yeah, I mean, there's many different kinds of uh, mesh that's available. Um, we work, we've done this in other projects, so I, I, I mean, I just, I, I, we, we haven't gone 
that far to do construction drawings for this design. So I couldn't tell you the exact, um, but there's, there are meshes that are available depending on what the water flow is and how you want that water to flow. Um, there, there's various uh, mesh material that's, that's available. I also want to say on the, the if, if we do the cast concrete for um, the benches, those, that concrete can also have cast into it granite. So it can be a combination of granite and concrete. Of course, we want to work with um, you know the local granite that's uh, that, that's very common to and, and known, and make a statement about that as well. Barry, at the Barry Gray. Nathan, um, ten seconds. Curious again about the <coughs> audio piece. Would the would the content in the audio documentation documentaries? evolve and change or we get what we get or um, our hope is that actually it's the beginning of a collection um, it, it's one of the things like the meandering path that extends we hope that that the collection could grow we hope there's life after life here yes and we see. hope to make this place a gathering place for the high school students to hang out after school to enjoy nature and to meet your friends. Michael, we're out of time. Thank you for being on the line. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Michael. Thank you. I wasn't cold, folks. Good evening, everyone. Yes. Yes, yes, please. please turn this off as well. Thank you. I'm Rodrigo Nava. I'm Gregory Gomez. We want to thank Paul and Greg and the committee for having us here. We welcome everyone to our proposal. We start off a little bit of history in our context of, of what um, we're interested in. And we, we, what we've, in this collaboration, we've come together and we really like the idea of sculpture that's interactive. Sometimes that's not intentional. This is a, a John Harvard sculpture at Harvard where everyone touches John Harvard's foot for good luck to get into Harvard. It doesn't always work though. There's sort of an intrinsic human nature to want to touch things people have touched or touch things that attract you somehow. You can hear you. Things that are sharp, things that are shiny, things, you know, there's an intrinsic human nature to want to touch, compel to touch. This is the National Gallery in Washington, D.C., the IMP uh, East Wing, and it has this very sharp edge uh, of uh, stone, and people are compelled to touch that corner as you go around there. It's, it's a physical contact with the building that everyone goes by and needs to touch it and leaves their mark. Oil stains. So we have a lot of uh, text here, which I'll let you read. Um, but we're very interested. Pardon? You can't say it from everywhere. Oh, OK. OK. Which I'll read it then if you want. Yes. Our two-part sculpture for the new one Taylor Street Transit Center, Counter Rotation, that's a working title, honors Montpelier's relationship to the river and a history of smaller economies in the state. I think you've seen this one before. This is this early rendering. Mm -hmm. As early as the late 1700s, grist mills were located on and powered by the North Branch River. There are three locations, uh, two mills on uh, Winooski, and then uh, the upper red circle is the um, is a flower storage. 
In the 1850s, a dam on the Winooski powered a flouring mill that extended to the bridge, to bridge Street, now Taylor Street. The W. Bailey and Company had a grist mill on the north bank of the Winooski, the current location of the Shaw's supermarket, if any of you are familiar with that. Here's an ad in a newspaper for uh, A.C. Uh, Dewey. The milling of flour and grain continued through the 1800s along the rivers at various sites with A.C. Dewey flour, flour Warehouse in the vicinity of One Taylor Street. Vermont Central Railroad arrived in Montpelier in 1849 and became an integral part of both commerce and passenger transport to the state capital. It really changed everything when the railroad came in. Here's a picture of one of the early trains. This is a train that was manufactured in DeSiller, the first train that came to Montpelier. The passenger depot and freight house were located across Taylor Street from the future site of the transit center with various railroad car houses also located in the vicinity. Here's that depot, which was a, uh, obviously was a, both for passenger and for freight. Processing the stone, quarried and buried and moved by train became a main industry of Montpelier by 1914. 41 granite-related businesses were recorded in the area. And, and many small businesses in addition to the, to the, uh, to the mills were in the vicinity but it, there was almost a transition from, from the milling to another small to, the, to what the railroad brought and, and ultimately the, a lot of granite working. It's just a map of the Blunt Central Radio Railroad. Our design uh, is for an interactive sculpture made up of two separate but equal parts and it's important that these pieces are balanced, the two elements are balanced. So here's the locations um, you can, I don't know if everybody can see sort of where they are here on floor plan. B and A is the interior of the transit center. Right there where it says transit center, right above that's where the, um, the, the desk is. A, Go ahead. A durable rotating cast concrete. We've also been playing with the idea of granite bench evoking a millstone as well as primal structures from nature. So this is a model of our bench. We have it up here, but we'll show it to you here if it plays. The bench would be seven feet either cast concrete or uh, granite, probably local, local granite. Uh, it has seven places for people to sit. It would be comfortable, but not too comfortable. <laughs> so it would also fill the seating need in that area. The bench would rotate when pushed by two or more visitors to the transit center. So people would, might be seeing there, they might uh, get together to push the bench around. The bench would only go counterclockwise. The idea is that the bench is heavy. It's not so heavy it cannot be moved, but it's heavy that two, you know, you need two people to really move this bench, so you need to work together. It would be more than just the weight. It would there be an internal gov governor in the, in the uh, underneath that would limit the, the pace of it. So go back, you didn't read the last one. Oh, sorry, each rotation passed north would trigger a hardwired split flap counter located high on the wall. So there's a little brass bronze. circle, bronze or brass circle you can see there, that when that goes passes north, going counterclockwise, and north is the meeting of Taylor Street wall and the long um, northeast wall. So it would also function as a compass. So split flap signs are something that people are very familiar with in train stations, bus stations. And it would be hardwired, so it would be a very simple connection. So I can illustrate. Oops, I don't want that to happen. It takes a while for this to load, I think. <clears throat> The 
This is four lanes. Gives you such context. This is the uh, rendering of sort of a rough rendering of the interior of the space, just so you can see the relationship in the space. This is a blueprint, so it's rather dark. It will be a much lighter space than this. should be visible from the ticket counter. This gives a approximation of what it would look like in the space. This is not the actual space, just so it's clear to everybody, but this is just so you have a feeling of the idea. So the split flap counter is um, what has uh, places for 50 letters. Each, each of the each of the, the cylinders, and um, we only need uh, 26. So, so the extra letters, uh, the extra slots would allow us to put other other information there, and that's something we really want to work with the community to discover what, what we might put in there. It could be um, one idea is to put in use um, number systems from other languages to intersperse. So occasionally you get to a not a, not a recognizable letter, not a at our Western Arabic uh, number system, you might have um, other other numbers visible that would come in and be part of a learning experience. This is a 16-place single row split flap that we've been working mostly. And whenever it flips over, it doesn't just have to flip one number. It could it could again go through the full cycle to in order to to, to move to the, the the last number. And really, to add that auditory quality to the work. So that that was a that was a Babylonian number two. Babylonians, you are the people who invented our clocks, our basic system that you, our clocks work by. This is a, a Japanese number four. <laughs> Counter rotation would orient and invest participants in their past, present and future in their community. Uh, the other thing I want to say about the split flap is that we could um, we could bury uh, messages in there. It could be something that could be um, have, have information that's pertinent to Montpelier. Uh, we could have it be educational, like every time it comes to a prime number, it could, it could let you know that, things like that. We think that's really a rich place to, to play with this. Form, uh, must have content, and that content must be linked with nature. That's Alvar Alto, the art the designer. So we also recognize that this is this is relating to other forms in nature. This is a uh, diatom, which is a phytoplankton. What what whales eat? Or, uh, I think one of the things. And it's that phytoplankton. That symmetry that is sort of nature's paintbrush. Jellyfish. Sea urchin. Our two-part sculpture counter-rotation for the new 1 Taylor Street Transit Center honors the advent and evolution of commerce and transportation 
in Montpelier. And that's it. That's it. Let's put it back to the. Do you want to see the, 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 the some lights, interior. please, in the back there? The which group? The interior. The Sure. Committee, Our questions? Lines. I think. Um, how much do you know about the sort of uh, care and feeding of a Solari machine? That's the split that uh, um, They, we, we've all seen them in train stations and in, um, uh, in bus stations. Uh, the, there are many people, many manufacturers that make them. The one we've been talking to uh, has a modern modern version of it. They have it running from when they first create, you know, created this design. They have it running in their office. It's flipped a 3.9 million times without an issue. And they're durable. That's why they're in train stations and bus stations. In the back? I'm curious how the, uh, the messages are programmed into those. Is there flexibility in that, or would it be something that would be sort of fixed, or how does that work? There's quite a bit of flexibility, and we haven't quite ventured down that path, but hoping to do so with the community. They're, they can be web enabled. The new ones are very accessible that, in that way. We thought we could even have a website. People could even put in their own message if they wanted to. There's a lot of ability with this technology. Our proposal is for just the hardwired, more simple, but there's, there's lots of room to expand. In terms of the, so you just mentioned community. The other mention of community was about sort of pushing the, pushing the, the grist mill. Mm -hmm. um, in the path between now and installation, is there are there other opportunities for community engagement, and what would that look like? There are. You know, we've spoken with, um, we've spoken with a cast concrete uh, fabricator, who actually is, uh, in Western Massachusetts was actually from Putney, Vermont. Um, but you know, he works a lot with Yes Tomorrow School, so it could very possibly be fabricated at Yes Tomorrow School by students in a class at Yes Tomorrow School. I That's think in Waitsfield, Vermont. I think that this, the split flap sign and the access to the community to have input on that might be might be really fun for going into schools and getting getting to put the message and bear the message in the, in the sign. Yeah. yeah. Um, you said it would take two people at least to to start the thing spinning. Say you had like fourteen people all with a hand. How fast could you get the thing? <laughs> it, it won't be merry go round. Um, I, there are ways to, to put a governor in there. I mean, it would have we have a bearing system, and if there are ways to put a, a you know pinch yeah, or the, spring. The turntable would have a built-in governor. That's mm -hmm. the idea. It's in fact not actually even that heavy, really, in the cast concrete in the cast. Granite, or just carved granite, if that were the case, yes, it would be heavy, but there would be a governor. It would feel heavy, but not have the momentum. People know when they sit on it that it's going to start moving? I mean, will there be signage? Or I'm thinking I, of an old I don't think you'll be able to really move it around. No, I think it's right. going to be something that will travel word of mouth. People will know. Maybe it's like, hey, could you, could you get up for a minute? We're going to spin this. We want to, we want to add a number to the, <laughs> to the sign. Actually, would you help me? Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I don't know if you know this. Is the transit center open 24-7? I mean, the other two we saw were outside, and I wondered if if it's not open all the time, will people not have access to see it parts of the time? And I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that. I don't know. Actually, Greg. Right now, yeah, it's not going to be open 24-7, um, but it is going to be open roughly 6-ish to 7 or so every day. I see. So if you went but at 9 o'clock at night, you may not see it. You may not be able to get in there or something. Probably, yeah. Not okay. But hopefully, our bus system takes off. <laughs> I think the bench is more often. Sorry, I think the bench is being a standalone sculpture too. I think that'll be an elegant shape. I think it'll be uh, reminiscent of other forms. I think it'll, that that is a standalone sculpture in my mind. And uh, just thinking about the center of it uh, is 
Is that middle part uh, sort of covered over? Is it on a giant axis uh, that is not moving the center? It's not run on an axis. It would run on a turn. It would spin on an axis, essentially. Right. But it would run on a turntable. The it's center turn part is actually would just be a very shallow indentation. Okay. Yeah, the, the square is often how the, the, they had the hubs for those the mill stones. Those and would go straight through. This, those those this would all be a little bit. We don't want it to become a, a garbage can. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> or anything else? You're thinking. Or anything else? Can invite people to come and touch it. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Climb people, people may come up and, and check out the model if they'd like it. It does spin. We also have one uh, granite sample here too. Oh, uh, concrete. Concrete. Sorry. Concrete. Sorry. You want to spin? I do. Come on. I really do. <laughs> It's really satisfying. <laughs> but this goes the wrong way. It's only supposed to go. Well, we have a, this is just a, this is like a DJ. Yeah. I can DJ with this. Yes. Would, would the, the, it would make noise, I assume, as it spins itself. Um. Because your model does. Is, yes, is the model plan? clearly is on a big wooden plinth, and, and that it would not be on a wooden plinth. And most likely would not make a lot of noise. I think it's probably pretty difficult to not have it make any noise. It certainly would have bearings. It is a heavy thing. So it would only turn one way, which our model turns two, both ways. Yeah. But it would only turn one way. And most likely it would make some sort of little bit of noise as you moved it. Uh, so we're thinking of maybe 18 inches with a 2 inch um, kind of kick underneath. Uh, there would be no place where anybody could get a, a finger caught or a, or a clo clothing caught because it would, it would have a an apron underneath as part of the turntable. One more question. Sure. Why, why only counterclockwise? Well, well, I think because of because we wanted to be a color. Yeah. 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 And um, that's the name of the piece. <laughs> Sometimes you have to go in the opposite direction. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's really interesting how elemental the parts are, these two very sort of distinct items that have a relationship. I wonder whether there's any other, um, are you set in those two things, it being confined to that, or would it in any way encompass the space further with, through pattern, signage, um, floor pattern, um, any other, or is it really these two things? We have talked about, you know, having a, at some point the same thing that you can photograph with the phone and pull up a website showing a little bit of the history. You know, there maybe you you get to tune into it and pull up a website that would you could see how many rotations it has done from. I don't know if you're not here in Montpelier and you wanted to just check in on it. There would be accessibility to check in. There's lots of options. I mean, that floor is cement or would will be cement. Will be poured. You know. The pin, if it is cement, would be poured into place. There could be opportunity to extend that sunken uh, bronze quality throughout to maybe lead you to the piece. Explain rotation. We envision some signage too, and so if, the, if, if you're getting these these non-recognizable numbers, there there might be a, a key, you know, a selected key of, of what what numbers mean as part of that. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it would move that quickly. It's definitely not. Um, it, it would not move that quickly. I think the idea is that it would move quite slowly. I think there are ways to really limit the speed. There are ways. I mean, they have playgrounds where kids cannot hurt themselves. Yes. Can you build something similar that moves like this before? No, this is actually quite different than both of our own independent work. And this is our first this is collaboration. And it's exciting because of that. I have quite a bit of experience in other fields building things that have stone. moved and certainly stone carving. I think it's not a complicated mechanism. The mechanism that we've been looking at is actually an existing mechanism used for um, pallets, spinning pallets. 
uh, the one I've been sourcing may be a bit small. I've talked to some fabricators in terms of sizing it up. Everybody's quite confident that it's very easy. It's a very simple mechanism. And the technology for, for casting, should we go the, the, the cast the concrete way, exists because people are now casting, you know, countertops and uh, you know, chairs in their house and things like that, benches. Is there an etiquette protocol? I mean, <laughs> if I'm sitting there and I don't want to be turned around, <laughs> and I tell the, per the two people to stop and they throw a punch, <laughs> what happens? I, I, that would be very interesting. Take us a conversation. See what happens. But at least it would start a conversation. I would yeah. encourage you to then talk to them. Yeah. <laughs> or you could put a pile of marijuana. In Perhaps the I could just say, you know, it's actually not a bench, it's a sculpture. Because it just fills the need for the bench. It's not really that comfortable. The seat moves. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. We're still about a minute and a half, so if anybody wants to come up and spin it. Did, was there another question? I didn't mean to cut anybody off. I mean, anyone would like to come up, we have some time to come up and look at the mechanism and spin it. So. Oh, that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you all. Yeah, I'm going to have to. I brought all this stuff. Uh, I had a totally different idea in mind when I heard the presentation. Um, Slideshow, I guess. Um, yeah, that broke. So, uh, power flame. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sweet. Okay. So, um, all right. <laughs> Welcome to Montpelier's Got Talent. Um, <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> I'm used to hosting a comedy show, so this is a little bit out of my comfort zone. Um, it's uh, every month. Next one's February 23rd. I'm not going to promote it. But yeah, so um, 
Lights, we could turn that. That's good. We don't need it to be pitch black, do we? No. Um, yes, yeah, stay awake then, okay. Um, Sorry? The mics are on the table, so they're close enough. Mike, should I hold? Mike, no, you're no, good. You I just talk to the good. table. <laughs> um, yeah, pick you up. You're good. All right. So uh, my name is uh, Sean Williams, Sean Hunter Williams. I, uh, I grew up here uh, in Montpelier. I'm a second generation stone carver. Um, I work with my dad at Barry Sculpture Studios in Barry, Vermont. Um, I have been full time for the last five, five, five or six years. Um, yeah, so I know, I know what that, what that granite's all about, um, and, yeah, um, the, the, this, the, the PowerPoint's kind of just like a bullet point for, for things I, I want to say, and then, um, I, I get a little frustrated with the, with the computer drawings and, and, uh, and drawing in general, so I, I pretty much made, uh, my proposal, which I'll have to figure out how to, get to everybody we've done. But um, yeah, so what I'm about to flesh out is kind of a, a, just a concept for the, for the site. It could take on any number of different iterations. Um, but what I'm really working with is uh, starting from this idea of uh, basalt columns. So basalt columns are found <clears throat> throughout the world. Um, they are... Uh, just an amazing geological feature that you can find in the, um, you know, out west or uh, in Ireland, the Giant's Causeway, uh, Portugal, uh, Scotland has the same formations, um, and they're just they're they're really beautiful and and uh, awe-inspiring. And I wanted to start there because uh, although I, I do want to uh, continue to work in stone sculpture, I'm kind of trying to get away from the more representational work that I've been doing. Um, as a stone carver, I do mainly uh, commission-based <clears throat> representational work, so I, I didn't bring any photos of my previous work, but it's, it's very realistic. Um, so this is kind of a different direction. The process is called columnar jointing. So basically, a, a, a huge lava flow will pour out over the land, and there'll be rapid cooling and uh, on the surface, these, these cracks will start to form uniformly on the lava, and those cracks eventually shoot straight down to form these, these columns. Um, and uh, the, the regularity of these, these hexagonal forms is, um, is just really cool. <laughs> so it, it kind of, um, it's inspiring because when I look at these forms, I think it, it's really at the intersection of sculpture and architecture because uh, sculpture is, it's something you, you observe and when I imagine a piece of sculpture or when I, when I imagine work um, as a fine artist, as a visual artist, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of images, I'm thinking of plastic uh, things that I can, I can make um, and people can observe you know, in the round. Uh, but when you get closer to these forms, when you get closer to <clears throat> basalt columns, um, they begin to trigger uh, a different part of your brain. And you're not just looking at these things, you're really experiencing them. And uh, some basalt will fall away to expose interiors like this one. I believe this is Fingal's Cave in, uh, in Scotland. No, dude. Uh, I like that. Yeah, it's um, so yeah, this is Fingal's Cave in Scotland, and some basalt will fall away uh, and make these, these interiors that really, um, you know, we bring with us our, our preconceptions of architecture and they really feel like uh, a purposeful space, a, a, a space with a function. And so it, it, in that way, it kind of, it's still like sculpture, but it kind of departs from sculpture in that way. Uh, but it's still very nice to look at. It's still very sculptural. Um, so another way that you can see this kind of architecture try to try to uh, start to show itself is, I know when I look at this formation, I see an amphitheater, right? Um, it kind of the way it's formed kind of suggests uh, a different purpose or or a purpose in general. And this is this this kind of architectural thinking that I'm trying to push 
uh, my work into, um, especially when it comes to site-specific sculpture. Or here, you see kind of a portal. It's, uh, it's, it's really easy to put this kind of, to imagine this, this functional use of this very natural formation which predates uh, architecture and civilization in general. <clears throat> Where is that? I think this is also Fingal's Cave in Ireland, yeah. Um, so when I began with my um, thinking about this concept, I just kind of went for it. And uh, this is uh, a scale drawing showing some things I was thinking about, different ways of approaching um, using this form, or these forms, or, or kind of communicating with this aesthetic, um, I could say. Uh, but these are very, bi these are very big ideas. Um, and I think the stone alone for something like this would eat up most of the proposed uh, budget. So I had to scale it back a little bit, but I did, I did have some fun with that. Um, and this is going more. Sometimes also you'll see in basalt columns, you'll see this kind of sweeping, uh, very long curves that, that, that take place over um, long distances. It's, it's kind of like a wood grain. It takes on this entirely different quality, even though it's very rigid, uh, hard material. And this is kind of going more in the approach of the, the, the straight up and down um, uh, formations that you'll see, the really regular kind of, um, I guess they're, they're around one and a half feet kind of sections. Some of the sections can get huge, like the first one I showed you with Devil's Tower, those sections are, are massive. So um, what's so interesting to me about these formations is that um, you can really play with scale. They're scalable. It's, it's versatile. Um, and you, you really need a person next to it to, to see how big it is. Otherwise, you can't really tell. And that's, that's this quality that I, that I love about it, which is this kind of sculptural and architectural quality that they, they inherently uh, possess. And they have this kind of draw as well. Um, though these locations are, are usually remote, um, they become destinations in and of themselves. They become places where people want to go, although there's uh, nothing else there. <laughs> so um, I, I'd, I'd like to kind of capture that quality with this, with this concept, with this work, um, and try and use it for, I guess you would say, placemaking. Um, so in scaling back the amount of stone that I could use, I, I, I tried thinking of ways that I could integrate this concept into the existing architecture. So uh, that, there's that rain garden again, guys, uh, right there. So uh, you could, we could, it could, it could be a rain garden. It could, you know, it could catch uh, the water and and be kind of a, you know, a fourth wall for that garden, integrated into it. Also, some of the some of the shapes kind of coming outside of it, but still attached to it. Um, but what I what, what I was really interested in was. Um, the, the sitting wall, and the sitting wall is on the south facing entrance there, uh, and, and there's a terrace, so um, I, I don't have all the, the plans with me, but I did actually make a mock-up of the plan, <laughs> so I don't have it here on the PowerPoint, but I, I, I did create the section that I'm thinking about using, and the sitting wall, uh, I think, is, is a great opportunity for this concept because there's an elevation change, so that the terrace sits about two feet above the sidewalk, and you have this ledge. And in the current uh, design, there's there's a, a kind of a bench integrated into that ledge, which is a, a sitting wall. And I, I think that you could that, that with this concept, I could also get this idea of um, the these basalt formations or um, these hexagonal formations kind of emerging from the wall, integrated with the wall, and with use of <clears throat> slabs, uh, it, it could also kind of cover the terrace with these patterns so that it, it feels like you are at one of these sites. It feels like you are, you are uh, at one of these natural formations. So I'm kind of going for this aesthetic here. This is, I believe this is Giant's Causeway. And, Ireland. Um, 
but also these little opportunities open up as well where sometimes the columns drop away and something starts to live in there. So um, there's a lot of fun you can have with these patterns and like I said, it's, it's scalable, it's versatile. Um, I, although I have these two sites in mind, um, I really think it could go anywhere. I think it could go down by the riverfront, if, if possible, integrated into the stairs or the rainwater collection system down there. Um, so long as these forms accent the site to give one the impression that they are standing on something much bigger, I think the, the work will be effective. So it's really to trigger this this architectural imagination where um, it, it, it's not like sculpture. You're, you're thinking more, or I've been thinking more about um, really curating someone's experience. How are, how are they feeling in a place? And so that's kind of more the direction you're going with architecture where you're, you're not just thinking about a house, you're thinking about how someone moves through that house. You're, you're thinking about um, you know the sensuous, you're thinking about what it feels like to be in a place. And um, I, I love these places, these basalt uh, columns, this columnar joining. It's, it's an awe-inspiring place to be. Uh, so <clears throat> we can hit the lights. Um, I have models. I got models for everybody who wants one. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, or I'll just leave them here until the end. I'm sorry. I'm switching my thing around. So this, this is the sitting wall idea I was talking about. <clears throat> and uh, we don't have, I mean, obviously we don't have basalt in Vermont. We have granite, uh, which is a much less dramatic formation of, of rock. But um, it, we have granite, which is very consistent and, and nice to carve. So. Um, I was going to use granite to kind of mimic these formations, but in addition, as, as a stone carver in Barrie, my experience of granite is, um, is not really just using Barrie Gray all the time. I've, I've carved stone from, from literally all over the world. Um, and so I think that really speaks to the transit center in that um, using different colors shows that Vermont's just not, it's not just a source. Uh, of granite, it's actually a, a, a hub. It's actually a global destination for granite, and um, it's a it's a global destination for import and um, and fabrication, and it's really a player on the world stage as well. And so I think um, when I think about you know the typology of of one Taylor Street, it's uh, it's a place where you are <clears throat> both rooted. There's there's residential, and uh, and then you're also very connected to the world at large. You're, you're, you're living above a, a bus station, so you're very connected to the world while being rooted in, um, in a small community. So um, this is kind of that integration with the sitting wall approach. Um, I, I don't even know if this would also be possible with the budget. Um, it, if there's a way to leverage, I don't know, it, it could be expanded. The concept could be expanded. Like I said, it's very scalable. Um, and then I have uh, some samples. So we have, you know, Canadian pink. This is Brazilian uh, yellow. You know, South African black. Um, this is Deer Isle. Uh, Deer Isle is lovely. It's uh, it's lavender. Uh, I guess I would call it lavender. And um, and Bethel White. I hope I didn't scratch the table. Um, <laughs> it's a really nice table. So it was. It was, yeah. Thanks, everybody. Uh, so yeah. So uh, and then you know, of course, we have we have Barry Gray. I believe this is Woodbury and Barry. Um, but you know, I'd like to use whatever's whatever whatever's available. Um, and sometimes. There are these larger chunks of something exotic that you can just, that, that, that um, well, I don't know, in, in my network I, I, I could have access to. So uh, I do like this idea of, of embracing uh, more than just um, gray. Gray is all over this town, City Hall, the building we're in, the Capitol. Um, it's everywhere. It's, it's, kinda, it's homogenous. I, I love it. I love carving it. But um, I really would like to show. Uh, kind of di the diversity within
granite. And, um, and I think that speaks to the, the general call of this, this ethos and bringing people together. And I think um, I, I, could, I could speak to that with the stone here. Um, and I guess you're free to, to ask questions or come up and see the model, or I could pass it around. It's kind of delicate. Um, you could come look at it. Uh, so that'd be great. So yeah, are there any questions? What happens when the water comes pouring off the roof? It, it hits the ground. What? <laughs> 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 you always seem to catch the water or freeze the water or whatever. Can you explain that? Because the water's going to come off the roof. And it's going to go down into the garden. And it's going to go down into these um, formations? Yeah. So I have, you can see in the model, there's a little, you know, uh, a, a little kind of waterfall shape that I made. Yeah. So it'll, it'll fall onto, it's very tiny, so um, I should have taken pictures. But um, so yeah, there's a kind of a, a waterfall that I created with this aesthetic, with these formations. Um, and I, I think the stone will do just fine. I think there's you know some joinery issues we'd have to talk about uh, between granite and concrete, but I call up Joey Calcani, he'll know what to do. Um, so yeah. <laughs> uh, Say, um, I really like your idea, the diversity of different colors of granite. I think there have been a lot of conversations going on in the community just the past several days about diversity. So I, I really applaud you for that. Um, and I, my question was, is, um, are you talking about carving individual columns and then attaching them to each other? Right? It's not just one big block of each color, but separate, actual separate columns that are then attached to each other? I would, I would avoid... Uh, Joinery as much as possible. Okay, so I, yeah, so I'm ta I'm thinking in chunks, and that was kind of why this this smaller scale was so useful for me. Because although I'm playing with these little little pieces, I can imagine. Okay, this is a block, this is a block, and they'll fit together. Um, so there would be some some joinery work happening between the blocks, but I'm I'm not going to be ca carving individual columns okay. and okay. pinning them together. That's um, <laughs> yeah, that that'd be super hard. So. Um, in, on the sitting wall, though, uh, I'm kind of thinking that this this initial ledge here is kind of a kind of a very thick veneer, uh, a carved veneer, and then as it covers that ledge um, behind it, I could set a kind of a like a three inch slab with this pattern sandblasted into it, so it looks as if the stone reaches back into the terrace, and then from that from those slabs. I could then sit another piece and join that with, with the slab. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? So um, that's kind of a three-part system to, um, to kind of expand this concept. So yeah, and make it, make it scalable without, um, without buying 50 tons of, of granite and recreating um, you know, Devil's Causeway. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, anyone else? I'm just curious about the granite blocks itself. Is it polished? I mean, my question goes to like Devil's Tower. I see it, I've been there, and it has the striations in the columns are not perfect. Yeah. And, I, and, and that's part of the beauty of the column and the tower. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. I mean, are we going to have just straight? polished granite blocks or not at all no and I think I think the um, in, in mimicking the natural formations that really gives me a lot of room to to play because I don't have to make things so uh, rigid and straight and exact um, and I think that would that would make work go a lot smoother for me um, because you can kind of find these um, these little moments uh, that are that are fun and that's that's kind of it goes back to this idea of the intersection of, of sculpture and architecture where from, from afar it looks like a sculpture, but when you get close, I'd really like people to be able to uh, experience these things. So um, here, this is, I mean, this is 1 12th skit well, one inch equals a foot. Yeah, so that's 1 12th. Um, so you have these little, these little moments where you know, people can sit here, but they can also sit back here and kind of feel as if they're, they're in a private space. Um, or um, you know, or, or everybody can sit next to each other, or at the same time. You know, it's kind of a, it's it's opportunities for 
interaction with other people as well as um, as well as the work itself. So, uh, yeah. Any other questions? Hi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This, um, so the tallest part here is eight feet. And then on this small model, um, it, it, it'll be a lot easier to see scale because I, I have a little scale guy. And, um, but the, the tallest part would probably be the rain garden. Um, and I think that would stretch upwards of eight, eight to nine feet, um, depending on what block I can find, really. Um, so yeah, any other questions? Um, we talk about the community engagement aspect in the process of creation. If there's yeah, a I mean, uh, our shop's at 15 Blackwell Street. It's open invitation. Anybody can come at any time. Uh, that goes to, that's to everyone here. Uh, if you'd like to check out Barry Sculpture Studios, you're, it's, it's always free to come by. So um, if, I, I don't, I would love to teach more people to do what I do, I, I, I would, but um, I don't know. That's something I'd really have to look into maybe with the smaller elements. You know, if, if we decided on doing more like bench size things. I don't know if you've heard of the bench project down in Rutland, but they do a bench every year, usually in limestone. Um, so that's the other thing. Granite's really, um, it's, a, it's a steep learning curve. And, um, but I, I, re I would love to see more people, you know, like Miles and myself, to, to starting and, and getting involved. So um, if if there is opportunities for that, I'm definitely welcome. Uh, or uh, I would I would love to hear any um, any suggestions for that. Working with the school or, or anyone else who wants to learn. So do you envision like people climbing up on that and sitting on the top of it, and kids climbing around on it and doing all that kind of stuff? Yeah, totally. Yeah, um, I think I, I think that'd be perfectly perfectly fine. Um, if, if if it became a worry, we can always change the height. Um, I I don't think I don't, I don't think it would be a problem. But it, if you know, uh, it's it's flexible. I mean, the idea is really the concept is really speaks more to suggesting what's going on underneath the ground. So. Um, as long as that connection to the to the earth and um, this kind of part of your imagination is triggered where you can imagine that there's just rows of these colonnades uh, beneath the transit center, I think the work would be effective. So it doesn't need height. Um, I think it would make it more interesting. Um, but if, if, if there are safety concerns, it's it's totally malleable. Well, I was looking at it. It's fun for the yeah, I think it would be fun, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'd get right up on there. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess I'm wondering about the size of the columns. I mean, the pictures we saw, I, I guess I'm not really sure, having never been there, um, you know, how wide they are. Um, I'm hoping they're at least, you know, average foot size. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Definitely at least a foot, probably a foot and a half. Yeah. So, you know, one's good to sit on, two's better. Um, and lots of different heights. Yeah. Well, I don't know. How would you describe the different heights? Uh, the different heights would be in and around the 18-inch range, so average bench height, maybe going a little bit higher than that. But like I said, the wall itself is is two feet off of the street level, so that's that's a bit high to sit on. But you can totally sit on it. Um, and then there's this kind of play between you know tra transportation. Uh, buildings where they want you to be comfortable but not too comfortable so I think this kind of fits in with that where I I'm not tailing tailoring this to people's comfort but they can totally sit on it um, and uh, it would be outside so it's um, you know 24 7 and also it's granite so it's totally durable and you know, it's gonna be maintenance free. Jill. What, the sitting wall's facing south? Yeah. And so, yeah. So uh, oh, I guess I could come look at Yeah, that. there's been a lot of slides already about the, the south facing uh, side. So that's the same side I've, I've chosen. Um, but I, I have made a, a little model of it. Um, the rain garden's right here. And the sitting wall's right here. So the sitting wall faces the river. 
So yep. the long side that you're looking at right there is as, you're, as if you're looking across the river. The the side closest to Sean is the Taylor Street where the buses would pull up, yep. and that's where the rain garden yep. is. Would the bike paths run between the sitting wall and the river? Um, I don't think so. I think the between the sitting wall and the river is a bus zone. That's where all the buses are going through. Greg? Uh, 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 between the sitting wall and the building is a porch. Yeah. So it'll be pretty active space. And then the other side of the sitting wall is where you wait for buses. Then there's a bus lane, and then there's the river. Yeah. Or then there's the bike path, and then the river. So if you step off the sitting wall, you're in the bus, the... the nope, you're, you're on a sidewalk. Okay. Yeah. Waiting for a bus. Got it. And you're protected by vehicular ballers. So, <laughs> once again. So, Sean, I have a question about you. You've got the large model with the color uh, things, and then the little model has smaller installations, including the garden. Is your idea that uh, this would encapsulate both the garden and the sitting wall? These are different iterations of the idea. Um, I, ideally, I would kind of have them on either side of this uh, southwest entry, so it's kind of a gateway, um, and people get to experience it waiting and also arriving, uh, arriving and departing. I'd kind of want to get this um, this uh, integrated with the you know the traveler's experience of hanging out at the transit center. So I, that's why I chose the sitting wall. It seemed to be the most um, public place, or well, not the most public, but the most um, most potential for inter public interaction. So, um, and following up on uh, the last question, how far will the money stretch around? The Building, roughly. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I mean, can you wag it or just? I, you know, I, I honestly, I did do some light budget calculations with this. I didn't really want to be hindered by thinking about money too much, but um, you know, it'll take some finesse to get this this idea at the scale that I'm I'm thinking about it uh, as. Um, but the 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 budget the, the budget here will um, definitely go a long way and uh, you know I, if I'm able to shop around I think I could find good deals on material um, and because of the the forms are uh, relatively simple and kind of free um, I would feel pretty comfortable subbing the work out to, to different people as opposed to like a you know an angel or like a portrait I probably wouldn't let anybody just help me out with that. Um, so this makes it more doable for me with this kind of budget, but you know, uh, Barry Gray's thirty-four bucks a cube. So that's you know we could you know that's <laughs> it's it's not a whole lot. So yeah. All right. Thank you so much. So if we could cut all the lights, please. Okay, my name is Michael Zabrowski. Uh, I live in Morrisville right now. Uh, so I've been, in, uh, I've been in Vermont for about four years um, and have gotten to know a lot of, you know, the, uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just move on. Um, I'll, I'll uh, you know, get to it here. So I have a statement to read, and then I'll, I'll uh, you know, open up a little bit more with the images. Uh, public art is a vehicle for installing uh, wonder and absurdity into our daily lives. It is to be experienced by all, and it defines our public spaces as places of cultural reflection and indicators of our social, economic, and environmental agenda, makeup, and our values. The One Taylor Street development has many layers of interest for me as an artist and a designer. Yet there are two site-specific elements that have served to be the most influential in designing the proposals that I'm gonna share with you right now. 
Uh, these two elements are the net zero ethos of the building's electrical infrastructure design, as well as the importance, management, and power that water has on the site, but our planet, right? Uh, I have always sought out ways for my work to integrate and highlight in a profound way the systems at work around a given place. Enhancing our awareness of these systems and presenting them with a level of absurdity and expressive rationality. This is a strong part of my creative desire and my output. I am presenting three works as a part of this proposal. Uh, Fountain, No Rise, and Dash are the current working titles. <laughs> While they are distinctively separate, they are also uniquely intertwined in both conceptual definition and pragmatic execution. All three works take advantage of the fact that the building and its infrastructure are being you know, put into place, implemented, built, constructed, uh, all with the works. So this work is only feasible with this unique aspect of the, the project. Uh, this was my first sketch after leaving the meeting at um, uh, Greg's office. And, uh, you know, and, and obviously the, a lot of what I connected with came out of that, that meeting uh, immediately. Uh, so this, I, I really talked about some of the systems and things that I was interested in. So solar uh, array, uh, battery storage, uh, rainwater collection, uh, and then beginning to think about the usage of these things, you know, how can water be used, uh, how can electricity uh, be utilized. So to talk about fountain, uh, fountain for me is uh, in a way kind of trying to challenge the idea of what a fountain is. So obviously fountains are, are prevalent throughout the world as an important definer of public space, and, you know, it's, and it's the water, really, that's the sort of core. Um, so being that I wanted to, to challenge this, I thought about the idea of uh, collecting rainwater off of the, uh, the porch, right? And I loved that this building had a, had a porch. It makes it more uh, home than just, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a transit center. Um, so the, the, uh, the way this would actually work um, is sort of pulling the building away. You have the, you have the, uh, the roof uh, as it's designed, so the, the water would be collected. And I think it's designed to actually go right into the uh, rain garden, um, but I'm actually proposing it to kind of go backwards. So uh, the water would be collected, uh, traveled down, uh, at the one end, I have sort of a taller uh, uh, transfer tank that would sit on the ground uh, collecting the water, and then that would actually get pumped back up into this larger tank, which sits sort of right at that entrance corner. Um, and, uh, and then that tank would ultimately feed this line. And my initial idea was, you know, you can see in this concept uh, composite image was just the idea of the typical like farm water tank, and then the sort of you know John Deere tractor like sprayer arm. So the idea that that uh, uh, the fountain is actually just supplying this mist to the rain garden itself, um, and that mist to me is really like an experiential thing. Uh, I'm proposing that it's sort of. A regular thing. Time is a really interesting thing, uh, and a, an important part of my work. Because when you come to this space, you're going to always see it in a different way, whether it's weather, whether it's time of year, or, or whatnot. Um, and the mist would have that quality. If it's more humid one day, it's going to react a different way. If it's you know uh, kind of a day that you want to like walk by it and it's running and it's and it's even a nuisance, like that's gonna be a different kind of experience, but it's always gonna, it's always gonna change. So I like that idea of the, uh, the mist in itself. Um, so it's really this sort of cycle and, and system. 
And I intended it to be a seasonal thing because that obviously references the agricultural cycle of Vermont. So this thing, you know, runs in the nice weather, just like a fountain. It's winterized uh, at the end of the year. But it doesn't stop, you know, kind of giving back uh, uh, throughout the colder months. Uh, and one of the things that I always really like to enjoy in challenging the work is how does this work at all times? You know, not just during the day, but also at night. And since these are uh, uh, proposed as these uh, translucent uh, water tanks, uh, they could actually be lit from the inside. So the, again, connecting back to this idea of the front porch. And to me, I instantly kind of thought about, like, these are these absurd, like, leave the front porch light kind of on. Um, and ultimately would serve as this kind of beacon, right? I mean, you would, you would see this from, you know, across the Taylor Street Bridge. You would see this from uh, Taylor Street. Uh, you know, and, and I love the idea when this thing's, you know, half full of water and you're under it and you, you get the sense of that level of the inside from the white water that's actually, or the light that's illuminating the tank and also the, the water. Uh, also plays in, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, so I'm a Rust Belt kid. Like, I, I love railroads, I love grain silos, I love this sort of industrial uh, uh, heritage that our cities are sort of built on. So this to me is like, it's sort of a no-brainer to put a, a, a hall, tall water tower next to a railroad track. So it, it talks about uh, the connection to those, uh, uh, to those elements. Um, the next uh, uh, work is called No Rise. So as soon as I sat down, you know, it was said, No Rise, all in this area. And it's a super cool, you know, limitation, right? It's like gravity, there's water, it's gonna flood, and there's certain things you can do and certain things you can't do. Uh, so I love this idea and this challenge of going, well, what could go in this flood area and how can it still have an interesting impact? Um, so I instantly just thought of uh, the idea of just a concrete slab or something that's you know, entirely uh, at uh, grade. Um, and then I began to think of this idea of uh, countering the fountain, right? So if the, if the fountain is sort of the, you know, the, the fair weather friend, uh, this is the one that takes us through the winter, right? So the, the fountain goes dormant, uh, no rise sort of wakes up. And uh, what it is is u utilizing a, a typical you know, concrete driveway sidewalk technology, which is putting uh, electrical coils into it, so it actually heats, melts the snow, right? Like people love this for you know not having to plow their driveway, or, you know. Um, and this would actually become something that is now tangible. Like the, the public art aspect to me is actually kind of offering heat in a way. Um, so this would, this, you know, circle as it's proposed would always be, uh, you know, kind of prevalent. And I, uh, um, I actually, I was, I, I love the idea of, you know, uh, it's sort of like the Duchamp kind of ready-made of finding something and, and appropriating this. And I loved the, um, the uh, North arrow that you guys are using for your drawings. So it's actually, I copy-pasted that as sort of a start. Um, because I love the idea of this also showing the cardinal points. So the, the, you, what you're seeing is essentially that exact, uh, you know, north, south, east, west cardinal points. Uh, these would be precast wedges, sort of in quarters. So it's an eight foot diameter, um, and uh, they would all come together, you know, on the uh, on the site at grade. Um, and uh, the thing that I'm uh, sort of most excited to sort of test, and I kind of imagine that this would work, um, that, you know, I mean, one of the spectacular things about living near a Vermont, you know, uh, watershed and a river are, you know, the countless times that we get that amazing fog, right? You know, and it just sort of creates this, uh, uh, you know, sort of fantastical, Place. And my hope is that at some moment, and it might be incredibly fleeting, but that this would sort of create its own micro fog, right? So if the humidity is right, if the you know temperatures are right, 
that, you know, even if it's only this hot, right, you'd see this kind of little bit of fog sort of rising above uh, this thing. And then I also like the idea of no rise, you know, I guess uh, going uh, backwards, of, you know, to my sort of uh, uh, way of just thinking about our, uh, you know, uh, connection to this concept is I love the idea of somebody going and laying there and maybe pausing a little bit longer and, you know, looking at the sky and listening to the river. And so this kind of becoming this place where, you know, you can just sort of extend uh, potentially in this colder weather uh, kind of outdoor uh, experience of sorts. And this would be right, this is the far uh, east side of the, the property right by the other, uh, uh, the North Branch Bridge. So it's uh, kind of utilizing that, that space. Um, and then the other, uh, the third proposal is uh, called Dash. And uh, uh, this to me has kind of a double uh, meaning. The one is this kind of the, the, the hastiness of Dash, right? I mean, this is a transit center, so you're 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 spending maybe a lot of time because it's 15 minutes that you're waiting for a bus and it feels like eternity, but it's only 15 minutes. Um, uh, you know, so you're you're kind of moving through this space quickly. So I thought of the idea of like, you know, I mean, how many times you're seeing these departure things and you know other kind of uh, uh, technology-based things that are in airports and transit centers like this. Um, so I, I thought of the wall on the inside that's that 13 foot, you know, uh, high blank wall, sort of as these collection of, uh, again, kind of absurd versions of getting this information played back to you in, in some form. So, uh, and then I loved one of the things that, that Greg said was kind of like, you know, this is, and this is what sort of came to me as that moment of thinking about the building being built as the work's going, was like, what are the opportunities within this to then find ways to bring other public art kind of aspects to it? So um, I thought of the, the parking lot uh, lights as kind of an opportunity. So there's six of these, at least as what I can read from the plan. So I, I took each one of the six, and that's what you're seeing, kind of the elevation here. So you're seeing the wall uh, as you'd sort of see it through the, the glass, obviously not that clearly, but then uh, you're seeing the six uh, parking lot lights. Um, and I've done a lot of work with these ideas of these surveyors, um, building these things that then sort of look out and then give us uh, something back again. So one of the, one of the surveyors uh, I proposed to look at Ceres, so the, the goddess of agriculture on the top of the, the dome. Uh, so this would uh, be one of the uh, uh, elements, and this is using a closed circuit camera system. Again, kind of an inspiration of like the security, right? This is just a, a, an infrastructure that's sort of built into these kinds of projects. Um, so it'd be a closed circuit cam that's giving you an always live feed of a close-up of that sculpture, right? I mean, as a as a beginning of a public art kind of master plan, I think that's the like master. I mean, that's the, like the beginning of <laughs> you know the the public art of Montpellier is that 15 foot uh, statue. But it's something that we don't like. We see as this kind of white blur, right? So the idea of bringing that. Uh, back into perspective is one thing. Uh, the others are uh, the two that you're seeing join kind of as like an eyeball is actually the city, um, the city hall uh, top clock tower and then the courthouse clock tower. So the idea of the clock inside of the uh, transit station is now the clock you know, that's already everybody seeing in the city kind of being brought uh, live into that space. Um, you know, bringing up ideas of relativity. I wonder how well they're you know, <laughs> coordinated. Um, uh, the hotel flag, uh, you know, I love the idea of the dash. It's like telling you how windy it is, but it's not telling you, you know, the knots or miles per hour. It's just, is the flag blowing or is it not? Um, you know, so it kind of gives you a sense of, of that. Um, the one at the very bottom is uh, 
just the water surface. So the, the way that these are all set up are these monitors kind of on these, you know, sort of exaggerated uh, TV monitor mounts. So the, the water one is actually holding it out. So it's sort of like a tabletop, you know, view of the live kind of Winooski uh, water surface. Again, it's frozen, it's moving quickly. It's, you know, you get a kind of displaced sense of what's going on uh, outside. Sort of like, you know, you're caught on your phone or something looking at this. Um, and then actually my favorite one is this, you know, jumble down in the, the bottom corner. Um, and it's actually looking at the gas price sign on the Sunoco <laughs> station across the way. And again, Greg, I'm gonna say this because you, you, you said this, that, you know, the, the future is electricity, right? And that's how you guys thought of the building. So I love this idea of, you know, watching this thing, hopefully as the city kind of evolves in the next 30 years, as you said, Nathan, it's like 30 years from now, uh, that sign's gone, right? Um, so I love the idea of seeing that fluctuation, again, a dashboard of like, uh, you know, understanding our economy, all kinds of things that this gives us a, a lead into. But uh, the way that this works is that it's standing, you know, we're, we you actually have to kind of go behind the TV to see this one. Um, and opposite is the Tesla wall mount battery that all of those, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, the surveyors in the parking lot are, are have solar panels and are juicing this thing up ultimately to sort of net zero out the work that I'm proposing. So I'm trying not to add more to the load. Um, but uh, that sort of uh, brings it all in. And then this is the uh, this series of images. Uh, that you'd, you'd sort of see as this uh, collective. And obviously, they, they wouldn't be static. So you'd, you'd always sort of check in on these things and, uh, in a way, kind of see something new uh, when you came up to them. Uh, I brought my telescope today before this. So uh, this is actually you know, thinking about how, this, how the rubber hits the road, you know, mounting the camera to the, you know, the device that sort of gets you there. So this is the kind of thing that it's like, oh, yeah, okay. Um, you know, imagining the, you know, the, the weather, the rain, the clouds, you know, uh, at night, right? She's beautifully lit, you know, so this is something that, uh, you know, you can see at uh, five o'clock on a winter's day as you're, you know, catching your bus. Um, and then the last, uh, you know, I just, uh, so much of this was very, uh, you know, really driving conceptually what I was doing. So I kind of wanted to give the sense of how the nuts and bolts start to uh, work. And this is a beginning drawing of what some of these, uh, you know, kind of camera housings, you know, that follow that language of sort of big brothers watching you. Uh, but uh, obviously <coughs> people are never really seen in these things, so it's not a, a part of that. But uh, ultimately starting to show some of the, the ways that I think as a, as a, as a maker and kind of designer of the, the details. Um, so my last piece is really just thinking about what I do as a whole. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in the work that I create that isn't about itself, but it's very much about how it gets you to turn around, look out, and see another way of seeing what's been there for you all along. Um, and that's the search, sort of, it's a selfish search, sort of for myself, because I'm always looking for that. But I love the fact that it, it, if done well and done right, it can, it can start to, you know, kind of have people's perceptions shift, but also maybe just confirm what you thought, maybe in a more profound way. So. Thanks. Questions? Can we get some lights, please? Question of clarification. Are, are these three distinct projects that you're looking at, or are they, I mean, they obviously can be combined, but. Uh, I mean, the, the best way for me to answer is this is how I think. In a way, I can't not like I, I when I this was and thank you guys for inviting me because this was a pleasure. I had a lot of fun because I love looking at the overall and trying to see how the stuff works together. 
So I think one thing just sort of unravels and connects to another, and like I said, they're unique and distinct, and I think they can stand on their own, but my goal is always to think about how, you know, the multiple things happening and the way that you would experience the site ultimately have a flavor and have a, 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 um, a, a connection, because they do, right? It's like the water. So <laughs> it's just, so it's, it's if, if, Let me ask you. Yeah. Uh, if you had to prioritize those, which uh, and could only do one of the three, Sophie's so choice, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I mean, I, I'm really curious. To, uh, is For me, it would be the collaborative process that does that. You know, better understanding the budget, better understanding the building, the site, who's, you know, what other knowledge is there. Because I, I couldn't say I love one child more than another. I think it happens in the wash of moving forward that this makes more sense than that. And, and I, I mean, I do have some prejudices about how I could see that right now, but, um, but I think that's what happens, and that's why I like casting the wide net, right? Because there's certain things that make more sense, although, but I don't know that answer right now. Yeah. It wasn't clear where the low rise, no rise site would be. Sure. Um, Uh, this is the, so the, right here, uh, right where that is, that's the north branch, right, going into the Winooski. So this is right on the eastern side, right where the, uh, the, the path is. Yeah. Switch the lights. Yeah, that'd be great. There we go. And then this, you can see the overall plan, so I, I like to bury and layer my drawings. So you can see the whole uh, site underneath this yellow wall. So that gives you a sense of where that no rise is on that you, eastern you, you side. Probably, you should probably orient people who are not familiar with the plans with the site. Sure. So uh, under the yellow here, you see the building right in the center. Uh, Taylor Street is uh, right in that column of monitors there. Uh, this is the river and the river walk path right along and the railroad on the other side. Um, and then you can see the, uh, so if you're looking at the elevation, Taylor, Taylor Street there, the building, the parking lot, and then right between the last surveyor and the bridge, that's where the no rise would be on that end. Would the, uh, would the Tesla or whatever um, give you enough power to do, to pump the water from the trans, you know, transfer tank to the main tank, uh, power the heat coil and power the cameras? Yeah, the heating coil would be the, the bigger question. Everything else, yes. That's the one where I'd wonder what that cap gets, and I don't know that. Yeah. yeah. And how how many times do you think <clears throat> how many times do you think you need to replace cameras or mechanical pieces of this? Thirty years, I would think you wouldn't. I mean, all be commercial grade security kind of cameras with you know devices that were sort of statically linked to it. So I would think you know whatever the warranty is and the lifespan of those things and being chosen to be the right ones for this kind of project. So uh, the housings uh, I've worked a lot with. Uh, most of the stuff that I do is, is CNC fabricated when it kind of gets to this point. So the the white box if I go to the detail. Um, this is, uh, uh, that's a dye bond, so it's a really cool aluminum product. It's sort of like aluminum flashing on steroids. So it's got a really, uh, a, a, an aluminum layer on the outside and the inside. And the cool thing with the CNC is you can actually cut it and fold it. So this would be a seamless, you know, box that's cut and folded and would, uh, you know, keep out the weather and, and all of that. Uh, with those uh, elements, um, and then steel and, and uh, the kind of power coated finishes for laundry and stuff like that. For, for the other Bob? Um, your first piece of housing, um, you have two tags. Both of those would be illuminated? Yes. And why, why did you choose a, that first tag? You know, the big tank, 
Put it on either side or right. Is that just a, a sculptural choice that you made? Yeah, I mean, it is a well. It's it's it is somewhat based in absurdity, right? I like the idea of going like there's if it just goes to the one that it, uh, so there's a little bit of that, um, but I think to me it's connecting the 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 shift of somebody experiencing this. So if one's lower and you can kind of see it and you can even touch it, right? There's something to that and just even the shape of how it's gonna light that area. I notice where that putting that, there's a bicycle rack, so I'm sure I'd make a, you know, a bicyclist kind of angry, but there seems like a nice space to, you know, kind of occupy that. So if that's this sort of column of light and water that's like tangible, mm -hmm. and then this other one that's, you know, away from you. So I really like that as a part of it as well. And then the idea of moving the water through it, right? So that it does go down, it collects, it gets pumped back up and in. Um, and the other cool thing to, to add to the pump and the power, uh, there's, uh, there's these really cool little hydro uh, uh, electric generating like uh, fittings that can actually go in pipes that you can actually generate power, it's a very small amount, but you can generate power just through pumping the water through the pipe, which is cool. So that's the other thing is I would, you know, I think of this as uh, like, uh, you know, like it's guts, you want to see it. Like I'd want to say, you know, that's the pipe that's moving the water. You know, this is how it expresses that, you know, system in a way. And, and so I think it's extending that is part of the, the magic if there is any, you know, cool. which I think there is. <laughs> like to. Before we wrap and thank Michael, we'll take 60 seconds after his applause to tell you about what happens next. But first, let's thank Michael first. <laughs> so, what happens now? The committee will, at uh, some point soon, meet again to review the presentations. And the formal process is that they'll make a recommendation of the winner, the finalist, to the city council, uh, who will consider that at the February 14th council meeting in executive session. And then the council, as the owner <coughs> of the work, will award the commission at that time at that council meeting. So. It, 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 We'll see how that schedules out, but keep your eye out uh, for that February 14th Valentine's Day uh, announcement. And until then, I want to just again uh, thank the incredible <coughs> artists who came here. There's a, a clear through line through all these works that all of these would powerfully challenge us to think differently about ourselves and our community, and that inherently is the greatest power of, of art. So, could the artists please stand again, all of you, and accept our thanks.